seated. Well, we're back to Acts tonight. Please take your Bibles and turn to that portion that we're looking at, verses 1 through 4 of chapter 18. And tonight, we're talking about tentmaker ministries. But I do want to add a few things to what we have talked about in the last few weeks, with all the interruptions, of course, in between all those weeks. But uh, at the risk of beating a dead horse, I want to pick up with a few more extra things from where we left off on March 22nd in the message entitled General Revelation and Common Grace. That was back in chapter 17. I'll read just three verses of that. And I want to talk about this again because it is such a serious issue in reform circles. There are three positions. There is the hyper-reform position. There is the Arminian position, and there is what I think is the biblical position that falls in the middle of that. And I want to give you a few more verses on that tonight in case you are challenged, as you probably will be if you move at all in reform circles outside the BPC. Uh, you will probably be challenged, challenged at some point as to how can you prove what you believe from the Bible. Now, you recall back in Acts chapter 17, before we get into chapter 18 tonight, it says, verse 27, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though it be not far from every one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or civil, silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. And, of course, uh, we opened this passage up uh, several weeks ago to the issue of common grace, the thing that's very hotly debated today. Um, and there are people who think that because the pagans are pagan and they're not among the elect, God never gives them any kind of blessing at all. He never does anything to provide for them, make their lives better or easier, or give them greater opportunity to hear or understand or believe the gospel, even though they never will believe the gospel, if they are not among the elect. And we agree with that part. They will not believe the gospel if they are not among the elect. But what do we mean by common grace? We believe that man is not capable, as the Armenians believe, he is not capable of an unhindered response to the gospel invitation, and we know that. If he's not among the elect, he will not respond. Dead rocks do not hear sound. And so that is the problem with the non-elect. They are dead, not sick. They are dead in trespasses and sins. If you're not elect, you are dead, period. Dead people don't respond to the realm of the living. If I walked in here tonight and there was a dead person on the floor, and I hope that never happens, but maybe you walk in here tonight and I may be the dead person on the floor, uh, and that has happened with preachers who have died while they are preaching. Great way to go. But uh, suppose there's a dead person on the floor, and you walk over to them, and you say, boy, you know, you must be hungry because, uh, I mean, you're just not moving. You must need something to eat. And uh, so you run out and buy them a McDonald's hamburger, and you walk over to them and you hold it under their nose to sniff. And um, you say, doesn't that smell good? And there's no response. And so you open it up to see that luscious chunk of meat inside. Say, doesn't that, <laughs> well, I'm joking, of course. Doesn't that, doesn't that look good? And there's no response. And, and you wiggle it around to crinkle that little tiny bit of lettuce that's in there and say, doesn't that sound good? Wouldn't that be crispy as you bit into that lettuce and that pickle? And there's no response. Why? Because the dead do not respond to the realm of the living. Very basic principle, although people involved in spiritism try to teach you otherwise, that you can communicate with the dead and all that kind of stuff. But the dead do not respond to the realm of the living. And the same thing is true when we're talking about those who are not elect. Those to whom God has not reached in and by his mercy and grace regenerated them, touched their hearts. And, of course, we have the question of infralapsarianism and superlapsarianism and all that kind of stuff, which I've talked about in the past. I mean, which comes first? Does faith come first or regeneration come first? And I think they come exactly at the same time. God causes it to be that way. But that's neither here nor there. That is another huge discussion among theologians. But the dead do not respond to the realm of the living until God reaches in and does something about it. Very important for us to remember that. And Paul was preaching on Mars Hill, and Paul came to the conclusion that God had actually done something for those who were not among the elect. He, he gets the amazing, overwhelming 
impact of that through his sermon here. And within the context, he says we are all of one blood, one human blood. God has common grace to us going back to various pre-Abrahamic covenants. Unfortunately, many of those involved in Reformed theology, covenant theology, uh, believe that there are only two covenants. The covenant of works, the covenant of grace. But the Abrahamic covenant is clearly a covenant to national Israel. We are not Israel. The church is not Israel. Israel is not the church. God has separate covenants, and we study this in some detail, for Israel and the church. And we need to understand that very important distinction, because God made a covenant with Adam, the father of both the elect and the non-elect. God made a covenant with Noah, the father of both elect and non-elect. God made a covenant with Abraham, who is the father of both elect and non-elect. He had Ishmael, not only Isaac, as one of his physical descendants. As we move into the New Testament, we found Jesus referring to the elements of common grace and blessing, and blessings that are extended to unbelievers, things that we would call common grace, grace that is available to everyone. And we had very, very clearly stated for us that God you know, sends his reign on the just and on the unjust. He does something good for both. He gives both good health and strength. He gives both diseases, too. Our diseases come as a result of sin. But we find that God is dealing in an equitable manner at this time with both elect and non-elect. And that was the illustration that was given for us as to why we are to treat those who hate us and those who persecuted us with kindness and with grace. We mirror our Heavenly Father. Paul refers to that same doctrine in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 14, because he is the creator, God is the creator of all men. Uh, you remember, as he's standing outside, just before he gets stoned, it says, Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And he's talking to a bunch of pagans at that point. People who are about to worship Jup Jupiter and offer sacrifices because they think Paul is, is Jupiter and uh, or Paul is Mercurius and, and Barnabas is Jupiter. Very serious issue, but he says God was good because he gave you guys fruitful seasons. He gave you food. He filled your hearts with food and gladness. So the next thing that we learned was in verse 27b, though he be not far from every one of us, that means that God is close to us. God is knowable. God is not in hiding. The character of God is visible through the creation that we see all around us. That's why creationism is such an important issue, especially today. That's common grace that God has given to all men to make them accountable for knowing him. And we talked about that in Romans chapter 3 to some extent, that we can see God through the light of creation, Romans chapter 1. We can see God through the light of conscience, Romans chapter 2. And Romans chapter 3 is the light of special revelation, where God condemns that which is unrighteous. And by extension, because God has given that and has entrusted to us the proclamation of his word, that extends to the proclamation of the gospel in the New Testament, which we're commanded to preach in all the world. Not merely to those who are elect, but to all the world. Christians are the tools that God uses to extend his common grace to others around the world. I think that it was William Carey, who's known as the father of modern missions, who was trying to raise missionary support from some people who rejected common grace. They told him, quote, if God wants to save the elect heathen, he can do it without you. Hmm. I think that misses the obvious command of Christ. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It misses the last words that Jesus Christ spoke on earth before the ascension. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth, Acts 1.8. God himself has ordained the foolishness of preaching to save the elect who start out in time and space as lost. We need to remember that, folks. There was a day when you and I were, in fact, lost, dead in trespasses and sins, and on our way to hell. God elected us in eternity past, and God guarantees that we get to eternity future, but in time and space, there was a point at which each and every one of us was dead in our trespasses and sins until God reached down into our heart and sovereignly drew, drew us to himself and gave us saving faith and made us into what we are today. Christians, those who are on their way to heaven.
but there was a time when we were headed the opposite direction. That's why there is a call for repentance, even a call to repentance among believers, because sometimes we go the wrong way. We still have an old sin nature. And we talked about that last time when we were talking about repentance. And then, of course, Paul gives his capstone argument for common grace in verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being. The most obvious aspect of common grace is the sustenance of all human life and not merely the lives of those who are elect. As we noted often, in fact, the non-elect live longer lives than the elect, and it's God's mercy and grace to them in delaying the fires of hell. And there are a good number of other passages that bemoan the fact, which uh, I would like to read you a few extra ones tonight. You didn't, I didn't read these to you before because of time constraints, but especially in the Old Testament. Let me just give you a few. Here's out of Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 35. Here we find people who are wicked and evil, and yet who are getting blessed. For they have not served thee in their kingdom, and in thy great goodness that thou gavest them, and in the large and fat land which thou gavest before them. Neither turned they from their wicked works. God let them continue on doing it. How about Jeremiah 5.28? They are wax and fat. They shine. Yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. In other words, they're even wickeder than the wicked. <laughs> it's kind of a hard one to figure, but uh, how is it possible to be more wicked than the wicked? But he says they are. They judge not the cause, the cause of the fa fatherless, yet they prosper. And the right of the needy do they not judge. Jeremiah is puzzling over that. You see, people in the Old Testament recognized this problem. They thought, how can God, who is good, give blessing to people who are wicked? And yet they saw it happening, and it puzzled them. We don't have a full explanation of this till we get to the New Testament, until we get to the time of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gives us our first insights, and Paul expounds it theologically as we move farther into the doctrinal epistles of the New Testament. I think perhaps the most extended passage in the Old Testament is the complaint of Job, who did not yet understand the divine plan and the invisible heavenly warfare yet. See, there are things on earth that we can't see. There are some things that were revealed to the prophets in the Old Testament, like Daniel. He saw some of the things that are happening in heaven. And some things that Isaiah saw when he saw the throne room vision in Isaiah chapter 6. And Ezekiel, who had those magnificent visions of things to come. But you know, for the most part, they didn't understand, because of the heavenly warfare that's going on, why certain things are happening on earth with bad things happening to good people <clears throat> and good things happening to to bad people. Now folks, this is an issue that you will face. And it is, it's centered around the issue of common grace. That's why you need to understand this principle. Because even if you never get into a theological argument with someone who is hyper-reformed in their position and who does not believe that God does anything nice for, for the wicked people or those who are non-elect, you will run into the problem about why do bad things happen to good people? There are several, of course, false premises uh, in that, but let, let me read, just read you this passage. <clears throat> Job didn't understand the divine plan, the invisible heavenly warfare yet. He assumed, as many do so today, that if you are good, everything will go well with you. And if you are bad, everything will come to a screeching halt. Job had been righteous. In fact, there's a huge point made of that at the book, at the beginning of the book of Job. I mean, he's even making sacrifices for his kids in case they sinned in a way that he didn't know about. Job is clearly presented at the beginning of the book of Job as a righteous man. He'd been righteous. He was exceedingly blessed, which seemed to follow in his way of thinking and in the thinking of all of his friends. That's what the arguments are all about as you move through the, the opening chapters of the book of Job. His friends are telling him, listen, if you weren't a bad guy, God would not have smacked you around like he did. And Job is puzzled too. He says, I can't understand it. God, I want to talk to you. Why are you doing this to me? Where have I sinned? I can't see any place that I've sinned. I mean, that's what the whole argument of the first three quarters of the book of Job is all about. So, Job was righteous and blessed until the day God allowed Satan to test him. Job was shocked when he suddenly discovered the reality of those times when the righteous do suffer and the wicked are blessed. This is out of Job chapter 21. I mean, he, he has a whole discussion on that specific issue. He says to his friends, 
Mark me and be astonished. Lay your hand upon your mouth. Even when I remember I am afraid and trembling taketh hold of my flesh. Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, are mighty in power? Their seed is established in their sight with them, their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, neither is the rod of God. How do you think about that? The rod of God. You know, Jesus Christ is going to come to earth someday with a rod in his hand, isn't he? Psalm chapter 2. He's going to smash the nations with a rod of iron. Their houses are safe from fear, neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bull gendereth and faileth not. Their cow calveth and casteth not her calf. In other words, everything they own seems to prosper. They send forth their little ones like a flock, and their children dance. They've got a lot of kids, and their kids are happy kids. They take the timbrel and the harp and rejoice at the sound of the organ. they got all kinds of nice music. They spend their days in wealth. He says, and they don't die long, agonious, miserable, horrible death. It says, and in a moment, they go down to the grave. Therefore they say unto God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. What is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what profit should we have if we pray unto him? In other words, we got it all anyway. We don't need God. Job is saying, Why are the wicked prospering? And why am I, who am a man, who has been righteous, why am I suffering? He didn't understand what the New Testament teaches about common grace. He didn't understand what's going on in the heavenly warfare. And as a result, he can't understand it because the normal human way of thinking is, if you're a good guy, God blesses you. If you're a bad guy, God curses you. And that's why you run into that question today. Why do good people suffer? All they're doing is repeating what Job is saying here because he thinks he's good. And from God's perspective, he was a good guy. But he still suffered because of something that Job didn't know about until the end of the book of Job. Job finds out at the end of the book of Job because Job writes the book of Job. But while he's going through it, he doesn't know about the heavenly warfare, the warfare that was going on in the opening chapters. So although we can see in hindsight common grace, we today can see in hindsight the work of common grace in the Old Testament, it's only in the New Testament when we encounter the doctrinal teaching of Christ and the apostles that we have a theological understanding of what God does through common grace. Now, let me add a few more things to what I said last week also about the issue of culture. It's through the principle of common grace that we've been called to interact with our culture and the people around us. That's what we see in verse 28b, the second half of verse 28 there in uh, chapter 17. As also said certain of your poets, we need to know what they believe, the people around us, why they believe it, so that we can counter their false presuppositions with the truth. You know, that's the whole point of apologetics, and that's what Paul is doing as you move through the book of Acts. You know, most Christians don't ever study apologetics. There is an immense, huge, great, massive amount out there dealing with how to answer the culture with the truth of Scripture without compromising your position. Um, I was reminded once again, I got a, an email concerning Summit Ministries out in Colorado, excellent though very expensive, where they train young people, high school students and college students, to face the bombardment of the culture around them. They even have some, some sessions where they take you overseas and you study at Oxford University and where they interact with the, with the false pagan philosophies of the world around us. It's really a great ministry. There's that. There's the Ravi Zacharias Ministries and others that are out there dealing with those issues. Josh McDowell, one who you probably remember from years and years and years ago. He's been around for a very, very long time, and his son Sean is now picking up that ministry where you can interact with the culture without compromising your basic Christian testimony. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. We need to learn to do what the Apostle Paul is doing here in Acts chapter 17 where we are countering the false premises with the truth. Paul had clearly studied, and we talked about that in detail, so we'll not do it again, but he'd studied Greek culture, Greek writings, Greek poets, Greek sciences, and philosophy. Now, here's something I want us to, that I hadn't said before, but I want to add it, because we are separated fundamentalists, and that, I believe, is very important. It's very important 
if you're not a separated fundamentalist, you will soon be compromising with everything around you. But there is a very important distinction that we need to make. Separation, which is biblical, and isolation, which is not biblical, are not the same thing. We are called to be separate. We do not do the things that they do. We do not compromise in our faith or in our lifestyle the way that they do. But we do not isolate ourselves from those we are trying to reach for Christ. And unfortunately, most Christians today who are in the fundamentalist camp have taken the position of isolation and called it separation because they don't want to have to have that responsibility. That's the same way in which those people who spoke to William Carey, if God wants to save the, the elect heathen, he'll do it without your help or mine. That's the same kind of crummy excuse that really ends up being in the end. We need to understand that we are to be separate, but we are not to be isolated from those who are trying to reach from Christ. Too many times Bible-believing Christians have failed to reach the lost for Christ because of isolation, not because of separation. And then we give that feeble excuse of Carrie's detractors that the sovereign God can reach anybody he wants to without you and me. Of course he can. We know that. It's a true statement. God can reach the heathen without you and me. And he'll do it if we don't do our job. But that doesn't give us an excuse to disobey him. That's not the point. He commanded us to be the instruments by which he would reach them. That skill of engaging the culture on their own turf enabled Paul to reach the unbelieving pagans around him by using their writings and their words of people who they, they honored to be used against them. If we want to engage our culture, we need to be skilled in demonstrating the still visible vestiges of the truth the pagans have been trying to suppress. Paul says they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They hold it down. They are doing everything they can. That's a wrestling move that Paul uses in Romans to describe holding down your opponent so he can't get up. And that's what the pagans are trying to do with the truth. But they cannot completely suppress the truth. It is still there. They have to depend upon certain things that are true in order to survive as a culture. For example, they'll tell you, well, yeah, uh, you really shouldn't murder and rape. Why? Did you know Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, who was the serial rapist uh, and killer, uh, he decided that because on the basis of evolution it's merely a matter of, uh, you know, of survival of the fittest, that hey, this was okay, he was stronger and they weren't. And then he came to Christ, and then he gave his testimony from his prison cell before his execution, that, well, of course, uh, that's why I believed it was because of evolution, but he says, now that I've come to Christ, I have a foundation for believing that murder and rape are wrong. You see, they still have that, that remaining vestige of God's revelation through conscience that certain things are right and wrong. And you can pick up on those things and say, well, if you're consistent, why do you believe that? Well, because it's better for me. Well, yeah, but it might not be better for the other guy. I mean, that's why he wants to murder and rape, because he wants to murder so he can get your money, and that's better for him. He wants to rape so he can get the pleasure of having your wife, you know. It's not consistent position, folks. You can point that out to them. Very, very important for us to do. That skill of engaging our culture, we need to be skilled in demonstrating the still visible vestiges of the truth that they've been trying to suppress, but which penetrate their belief systems, their premises, their cultural norms. Now, we know those things have been corrupted over the centuries, but God never leaves himself without a witness. And one of the principal witnesses is creation. Acts 14, 17. Nevertheless, he left himself not without a witness, in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. That's the doctrine of common grace. That's what gives you the ability to penetrate your culture with the truth. So if you don't believe in common grace, if you just think, well, God can reach the non-elect heathen without you and me, which he obviously can, you miss the point that he gave you and me the commission to do it. And that's why Paul is doing it, not just sitting in some ivory castle talking theology. He's doing it. What you genuinely believe will affect the way in which you live. 
We need to understand that. Why should we be missionaries? After all, God is out there with you know his sovereignty. He can reach down and save him if you want. But he didn't put angels with megaphones floating around the earth saying in every language of earth, Hey, you guys down there, look at me. I'm a big angel up in heaven. I'm going to smack you if you don't trust Christ. He didn't do that. He said, Ye shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The question is, as you examine your own life, as I examine my own life, are we doing what he didn't just suggest that we do, what he commanded us to do? And part of that is apologetics. Part of that is what Paul is doing here. And it is founded on the very important doctrine of common grace. And then, of course, Paul closed his argument by showing the logical conclusion as to why we're accountable to God, for we are also his offspring. In other words, God is a source of life. We've talked about that on Sunday mornings. And then the verse 29, for as much then as we are the offspring of God. In other words, since you've admitted to my premise uh, through your own poets whom you believe, you can't deny my conclusions. And then the second half of the verse, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold, silver, or stone, graven by art and man's device. And that's what the evolutionist does. He thinks that the Godhead is merely a matter of stone. It's matter. It's stuff. The God that made us is just chance through matter. Through that hero of the plot, time. Do you realize that that is the foundational principle, not just of these guys who are worshipping idols that they've made with their hands. That is the foundational principle of evolution. Then we talked about repentance and judgment last week in verses 30 through 34. Um, key verses to show the practical impact of the resurrection of Christ on the future and how we live now in the present and how God winked at, that's the interesting phrase that Paul uses here, the times of this ignorance God winked at but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained whereof he hath given assurance unto all men that he hath raised him from the dead. That is the message we're to preach. It's a very simple message. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. It is that message, when it is expounded, expanded, and applied, draws men to Christ. Because their experience is, once you're dead, you're dead. But suddenly it begins to click when they see that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a real historical fact. It's not mythology. It's not Beowulf. You know, it's not Chaucerian tales. It is fact, attested to by multiple witnesses who are willing to give their lives for it. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, by which man he will judge the death, dead. The ignorance of which Paul speaks, we talked about, was a willful ignorance. God winked at it. He overlooked it in time past, even though that was rebellion, because he was offering what? Common grace to all those unregenerates. But as in all things, there finally comes a cutoff point of no return after which God has ordained judgment. We don't know when it is. Best not to put it off if you haven't trusted Christ yet because you don't know when that time will come because there is a point in time very clearly determined in advance. That's what he says here in the text. Just like with Noah and the ark, he preached righteousness for 120 years and they laughed at him, they scoffed him, but there came a point in time when they couldn't get in. God closed the door and then he caused it to rain. He didn't send the rain first, and after they were starting to drown, and Noah kept hollering at them, Hey, guys, get on board the boat. Get on bo No, that's not how God did it. Noah, his family, and all the animals got inside. God closed the door, and then it started to rain. If you haven't trusted Christ, you need to make sure that you've done so, because you don't know when God's going to close the door. There's coming a day when the rapture will occur. God will have closed the door. You will enter the period of the Great Tribulation, the seven years prophesied in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Seven years of the most horrific vengeance of God the earth has ever seen. Seven years in which the restraining ministry of the Holy Spirit is withdrawn from earth and so men become as bad as they can be. Right now the Holy Spirit is restraining that wickedness from being on earth. But think about the worst criminals you can think about and suddenly the entire earth will be that way. Talk about chaos. Talk about panic. You can see why when the Antichrist raises his ugly head up, they will, men will follow him because they realize that if they don't have somebody to put iron clamps on what's going on, 
it's all over. Day is coming. Day is coming. It may be soon. If you haven't trusted Christ, you need to do so right now. Might be somebody out there on the internet watching us that needs to trust Christ. I don't know about you here in this room, but if you haven't done it, you need to trust Christ right now, alone, to save you. He hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, wherein he hath given us assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. The resurrection of Christ guarantees the future judgment of the world. You know, that's one of the real problems with liberalism. I didn't say this last week, but I want to say it now. That's why the non-supernatural do-gooder social gospel teaching of the liberals is hollow trash and is utterly irrelevant. They have a non-supernatural teaching of the resurrection. They say the spirit resurrection, the resurrection of Christ was a spiritual construct. What? The resurrection of Christ was real and it was bodily. And that's the reason we have hope. That's the reason why judgment is coming. Paul makes that point very, very clear. The resurrection is the key to the Christian life. The resurrection is the key to eternal expectation of the believer in heaven. The resurrection is central to the New Testament doctrine of judgment to come. That's why Paul is using it in this text, to warn of judgment to come. As we pointed out last week, we need to remember that evangelism does not always need to be sweet and rosy. You know, God has a wonderful plan for your life kind of stuff. Most phony evangelism never mentions judgment. And if it does not warn people to flee from the wrath to come, it is missing one of the elements that we find in the messages of the apostles in the book of Acts. Because there is sin, there needs to be repentance. And we talked about that all the way from the Old Testament all the way through the book of Revelation. It's, it's a major theme of the Bible. We looked at a lot of passages in the Old Testament. We looked at a lot of passages in the New Testament. We're not going to repeat those to learn the various principles. But the principles that we deduced were these. And I just summarized without the verses. As we move to the New Testament, repentance was in the message of John the Baptist. It was in the message Jesus preached. It was in the message that Jesus gave to the disciples to preach. It was part of Christ's great commission. It's the only way to escape judgment in hell. Repentance is the key to experiencing the benefits of forgiveness. Repentance is a basic beginner doctrine, according to the book of Hebrews. Repentance is central to the principal sermons in the book of Acts. Paul clearly preached repentance in the age of grace. Peter preached repentance. Repentance can be too late. We saw that with Esau in the book of Hebrews. Repentance is a key requirement to escape judgment in the prophetic book of Revelation. Repentance results in a changed life, and repentance causes joy in heaven. That brings us to tonight, Tentmaker Ministries. I redid that because of all the cuts that we've had in our series up to this point. Chapter 18, verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth, and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Now, let me, before we start looking at the text itself, let me just mention a couple of things that we see in the middle of all that. It talks about Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. That helps us to date precisely when this occurred in the uh, book of Acts. That was 52 AD when Claudius made that declaration. Uh, there had been uh, some troublemaking by a certain group of Jews in Rome, and then there became a general rebellion in Rome, and so Claudius gave an edict commanding in 52 AD, commanding all of the Jews to get out of Rome. He got rid of them. He didn't do what Hitler did in the Holocaust, but he told all the Jews they had to get out. He wasn't going to put up with the troublemaking anymore because troublemaking had spread, and whether or not it was because of the Jews, we don't. history doesn't really tell us. But there was also a general rebellion, a spirit of rebellion that was going on in Rome, and Claudius decided that as a good scapegoat, as a good way to show people he was serious about it, he threw all the Jews out of Rome. And so that's why Aquila and Priscilla end up down at Corinth. That also shows the sovereignty of God, which we're going to talk about in just a few moments. But now we want to notice for just a second here, Paul's flexibility in ministry strategy. He was flexible in a number of different ways. Number one, this is something that very hard for us as Christians to do. You know, we've talked about the mentality of we always did it that way before kind of a thing. And, you know, many places where I have been, and I've lived in, as you know, many different places around this country and in different parts of the world. 
but there is a mentality of I can't leave this area because after all this is the area that I know this is the area that I like this is this is really you know I feel comfortable I feel safe being here now some of you all have also lived overseas but um, for the most part if you look at Christians around the United States most of them have lived in one tiny little spot all their lives nothing wrong with that nothing right with that it's an issue of where does God want you to be at any particular time in your life but notice that Paul was flexible he was willing to move on after he had established a foothold and a foothold in a place that he would have liked very very much because Athens after all was a cultural capital it was a very high-class city it was working with high-class people you know, wouldn't all of us like to be high class? I mean, Paul had an education. Paul was not an ignoramus. Paul suddenly found himself surrounded by people who had intellectual powers like he had. And people, some of whom were responsive. Get public hearing there. At a place where the judges of Corinth would sit, which was over on Mars Hill. He was making an impact. He had established a foothold. It wasn't like he got run out of town like he did at some other places. But he was willing to move on. In fact, he not only moved on from this cultural capital, but he moved to Corinth, which was a trade capital. Now, the Isthmus of Corinth has a, a, a huge cut through where they could bring ships from one sea to the other sea without having to go around the entire peninsula. So it was a humongous trade city. It also happened to be a very, very, very wicked city. In fact, there was a it was a it, it was it was a sex capital of the ancient world. There was a saying to describe the moral debauchery in that in the ancient world that said, uh, "Oh, he's playing the Corinthian. <laughs> that is, he is totally and utterly degenerate." That was what the city of Corinth was known for. Athens, known for its brilliant intellect. Paul would fit in there. Corinth, known for its abject debauchery. Paul wouldn't fit in there. Paul was an upright, strict, moral, pure Jew. And yet that is where God moved him. He had flexibility in ministry strategy. The second thing where we see that there was a flexibility, he was willing to work to support himself when there was no external support. He made tents. By the way, that's a very interesting word that we find here. It's the only place that we find it in the New Testament. It is a, a word that um, is used of making tents out of goat hair or camel's hair they didn't go down to the local shop and find a bunch of nice uh, fabric and then run it home put it on their sewing machine and, and make it into a you know D, uh, one of these v-shaped upside down v-shaped tents like you use the pup tents they didn't even make fancy tents like the ones we have with the pop-up external frames you know they were weaving the cloth before they made it into the tents Paul had learned how to do that he was willing to support himself when there was no external support you know, uh, every Jewish boy was taught some kind of a handicraft. And we find multiple illustrations mentioned. We'll not look at those tonight, maybe next week. But the rabbinic tradition of the time said, Whosoever does not teach his son a trade is as if he brought him up to be a robber. <laughs> every Jewish boy, didn't matter what other kind of education they got, every Jewish boy learned a trade. And Paul was willing to work to support himself where there is no external support. And so you've probably heard that term used in many ministries today in closed countries. They're called tent-making ministries. Sometimes it's dangerous or impossible for a missionary to work in a particular area unless he has what the government considers a valid trade that is enhancing the area where he is living. And you know, it's rather interesting. The same words that are used here of what Paul was doing it says when he wrought for by their occupation they were tent makers 
That is the same word that is used of physicians talking about one another in the ancient world when they were working together. Same word is used in different locations in the ancient writings of doctors, medical doctors, doing that. And so that is one of the reasons why uh, it is also used for medical missionaries. As you know, there are many countries in the world where you cannot get in if you put on your visa application, I am a missionary. I want to spread the gospel of Christ to your pagan country. <laughs> Have you ever tried to do that to go into China or to go into India uh, or to go into some Muslim country, Saudi Arabia, you know, or Kuwait or someplace like that? You won't get past the front door. That's why we have what we call, and it's based on this passage here in Acts chapter 18, tent making ministries. That's the reason for medical missionaries. That's the reason for agricultural missionaries. That's the reason for educational missionaries. That's the reason for industrial missionaries. Christians who go over and establish factories and then hire local people. And the government says, yes, we'll let you in. And we will turn our eye the other direction while you are also sharing your personal religion with these people here, and that gets out of hand, you know, that's why tent maker ministries are normally fairly quiet in their approach. But as long as it doesn't really get out of hand, you can be here because you are bringing economic benefit to our country. You are helping the people of our country with their diseases. You're teaching our people to read. It's supported by scripture doing that kind of thing. I mean, I wish there were a lot more people who are out there doing evangelism too. Some of these people who go over only go for social gospel reasons. They don't ever share the gospel of Christ. But the Apostle Paul was clearly doing it in that context. Or even as we saw in one of those frontline videos on a Fifth Sunday special some time ago, a missionary who runs a coffee house because he was an expert coffee roaster. How many of you remember that video? Do you remember seeing that? Yeah. Incredible way of reaching in. And then they're teaching people to grow coffee beans. They're teaching them how to, to raise the trees so they'll produce the best coffee crop. And the country, which is primarily Muslim, turns a blind eye the other way because they see it's benefiting the people of their country. It's reaching an economic need that their country has and something that is beneficial. And yet when people come into that coffee shop to drink coffee, it gives the missionary and his wife and others who have now come to Christ, who are on his staff, the opportunity to sit with the people who are drinking coffee in their coffee shop and share the gospel with them. Folks, there are so many creative ways in which we can be tent maker missionaries in the United States of America, right where we are, if we would simply learn these principles and use them. You don't have to go overseas to be a missionary. If you're not a missionary here, putting a large body of water between you and the United States will not make you into a missionary. If you're involved in any kind of activity outside of being a, quote, professional preacher like this guy, you can be involved in tent maker ministries. This is a passage that applies to everybody here. Are you a tent maker missionary? Are you using the platform that God has given to you to reach people for Christ who are around you? You see, that's what the Apostle Paul is teaching us here. It is not illegitimate to be a tent maker missionary. Where you're supporting your own self through whatever work or occupation that God has given you the skills to do to reach people for Christ. But most of us, because we are more concerned about bringing money in, we're stuck with that sin of covetousness, and we don't want to lose the job that we've got, we just say, well, you know, the way I'll be a missionary is I'll work my job, I'll keep my mouth shut, I'll put the money in my pocket, and then I'll give a portion to the Lord, and that'll reach missionaries someplace else who will then reach people for Christ. Listen, you can be a tent maker missionary. You can be a tent maker missionary right now, where you are, no matter what you're doing, in reaching people for Christ. A major application of Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. Now, we mentioned a moment ago, as a good Jewish father, Paul's dad had made sure that he learned to trade so that if things didn't work out in his rabbinic training, he would always have something to fall back on. <laughs> That's practical. 
In other words, Paul was what we have called in Western tradition a Renaissance man. How many of you ever heard that term, a Renaissance man? Yeah. You know what a Renaissance man is? It's a man who can do everything. He had a theological education. He had a classical education and the top knowledge of his culture at the time. And he also went to trade school. You know, I, I've been through seminary, folks. I know what the guys are like who mostly go to seminary. I mean, there are some who are not this way, but there are many, many, many of them, very few who are otherwise, who are in seminary today that have that kind of a multifaceted training and background. You know, if a young man wants to go into ministry today, he should be willing to get his hands dirty and do hard work to support himself and his family. Not just expect that God will drop an already well-established church into his lap that can pay him a salary to which he would like to become accustomed. I had so many friends in seminary like that. Well, after all, I'm a Dallas man. I mean, that's a phrase. <laughs> I'm a Dallas man. That means I graduated from Dallas Seminary. We are the best seminary in the United States. We have the top Greek program. We have the top Hebrew program. Uh, we have the best professors. Uh, it's the We've got the longest published theological journal anywhere in the United States of America, Biblioteca Sacra. We have a monstrous, beautiful library, and now they have an incredible campus. I mean, they've got all kinds of brand new buildings. And so a lot of young men who end up going through seminary like that, and there are other big seminaries out there too, a lot of young men figure, well, I'm a seminary man. I'm not just a Bible college graduate. I didn't do a, a correspondence course from Moody Bible Institute. I'm a seminary man, and I went to a good school. And if those people want me, they're going to pay me big bucks. I'm not going to work. I mean, after all, I need to spend my four hours a day in my office staring at the ceiling and meditating. And I'll, I'll get an assistant to do my counseling. A and I'll have secretaries to answer all of my phone calls. Somebody else can do all the reports and all the other stuff. But I will get up there on Sunday. <laughs> and after having crimped at the beauty parlor. <laughs> I will knock them off their feet. Now, they don't say that, but I sure ran into a lot of young men when I was in school that felt that way. That's not the way Paul felt. He had a better education than all of them put together. He knew a whole lot more than all of them put together. He understood his culture a lot better than all of them put together without compromising with his culture. And so many young men who are coming out of seminary today are compromising with their culture. You don't find that with Paul. It doesn't matter whether he was in Athens, top of the heap, or at Corinth, bottom of the heap. It was the same message. It was the same lifestyle. He did not compromise with his culture, but he reached his culture. He was separated, but he was not isolated from his culture. And that's what every one of us, as Bible-believing Christians, need to do. Not just the, quote, professional preachers. Every one of us who's involved in anything outside of professional ministry needs to be a tent maker. We need to be involved in reaching our culture for Christ right where we are, right where they are, reaching them for Christ while keeping ourselves clearly pure in the eyes of God and a good testimony before the watching world which is always looking for places whereby we don't live what we preach you know um, I have a good pastor friend who is a pastor in Beersheba Israel he was born into and brought up in a Jewish home here in the United States he wasn't saved until adulthood here in the United States and then he and his wife moved to Israel and he took manual labor jobs after emigrating to Israel. Because he was Jewish, he could do it. But he wasn't working in high finance and big business as he had done before. He was doing manual labor jobs in Israel. You know, during that time, while he was a tent maker, he led hundreds of people to Christ. Because he knew Jesus was his Savior. He knew Jesus was the Messiah. And he was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He was down at the bottom of the social ladder when he started out. But he led hundreds of people to Christ. 
He's been doing it for 40 years now. It's a long time. You know, he's been so busy that he never got to go to Bible school. But he's still reaching people for Christ. But you know something? He's a humble man. And so for the benefit of his congregation and for his own personal spiritual growth, you know what? He is right now, as we are speaking, he's going back to Bible school on a part-time basis. You think, man, a guy like that, with all that success, he wouldn't need to go to Bible school. But you know, because there has been criticism from the outside and there have been questions that he couldn't answer that came to him from his congregation. There have been challenges from the Orthodox Jewish community. At one point, they had baptized a couple of uh, new converts to Judaism who were young adults. The Orthodox rabbis broke into his church while the service was going on and they took him, beat him up, threw him into the baptismal pool and began to throw plastic chairs around the auditorium. And it's on video. The police didn't do anything to stop them. That man is, as we speak, going back on a part-time basis because he's still pastoring his church there to a Bible school that's held in the northern part of Israel. Pray for him. You know who I'm talking about. I've told you his name before. You know, I've also been in tent maker positions when the churches that I've worked for couldn't support me. I've worked in a sheet metal factory making giant grocery store commercial refrigerators. I've worked as a supervisor in a chemical warehouse at a plant that made everything from packaged soup to baby shampoo when the church I was serving there could not pay me. I've thrown newspapers. I've done lawn maintenance. I've worked as a radio announcer. I've worked as an attorney while planning a church in Alabama. Tent maker ministries. And I wasn't getting paid there. In fact, I was supporting the church. You, if you're not a professional, have also been called to a tent maker ministry. Too many young people today expect the world to be handed to them on a silver platter, but that's not the example set by Paul. Number three, we're running out of time. Third, Paul was willing to work in a subordinate position to Aquila and Priscilla, even though they were among his converts. Did you notice that? They had set up a shop there in Corinth. And so Paul, because he knew how to do that, went to work for them. He was working in humility. This guy who had just been debating on Mars Hill gets a job in a factory. Number four, did you notice something else? He flexed back to his original style of going first to the synagogue where he reached both Jews and Greeks. And we'll not cover all those principles here again, but, but I hope you remember back that that's the way that he originally got started. But as God opened different types of opportunities, he was flexible in his approach. Not in his content, but he was flexible in his approach to ministry. You know, he ended up going, at one point, down to a riverside where women were gathered to pray because he couldn't find a Jewish synagogue and he couldn't find any men that were even interested in spiritual things. He was flexible in his approach, but not in his content. Notice also something else here in this passage. The sovereignty of God in providing for Paul. This is really cool. Aquila and Priscilla were in Corinth only because of one reason. They were residents of Rome. They had originally been living in Rome. They probably grew up in Rome. They probably lived in Rome all of their life up to that point. You know, we're given their, their Latin names. We're not told what their Hebrew names are, but they're Jewish. But we're only given their Latin names, Aquila and Priscilla. But God knew that Paul was going to need a place to stay in Corinth. And so God moved an emperor, Claudius, in 52 AD to throw all the Jews out of Rome. And you know who two of them were? They were the people that God was going to use to meet Paul's need. They could look after the shop when Paul had to leave the shop to do some preaching. They could handle all the finances and business of the shop when Paul was out evangelizing. Paul was working for them. They had a trade that God had prepared them for in advance before he sent them to Corinth. A trade which, though Paul didn't know it, and Paul's dad certainly didn't know it, when he was back in Israel, 
His dad said, you know, there are a bunch of trades out there. I mean, I guess I could make him into a stonemason. I guess he could make him into a carpenter. I guess I could uh, have him learn how to be a shepherd. I guess I could learn, uh, have him learn how to be this or that or the other thing. Paul's dad said, you know, I think, I think what I want Paul to do. And we know that Paul had at least one sister, too, because it talks about Paul's sister's son who comes to him in prison. But Paul's dad said, with Paul, I'm going to get him into the tent-making business. Not knowing that years later, when Paul was a grown man, he would need that occupation to support himself when he was in Corinth. Do you understand the sovereign working plan of God in each of our lives to give us the backgrounds, the training, the opportunities, the abilities for something that we may not know about for 20 or 30 years? And then suddenly, God drops something in your path whereby you can use that training that God gave you all those long, long years ago. He's done it with you. Do you have your eyes open as to what kind of tent maker ministry, if you will, that God might have for you so that you can reach others for Christ? That's what's going on here in Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. God used persecution in this case to move his people to the new location where he had something special in store for them. You know, God can move people in times of rebellion. For example, the Tower of Babel, or when God moved Israel to Assyria and Babylon. God can use move people in times of persecution. That's what we see going on in the book of Acts, because the persecution that arose, the believers were scattered. They'd been told, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. They'd been told, Jews will be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and under the innermost parts of the earth. And what did they do? They sat at Jerusalem. So God said, okay, I can get you moving. I can move you out. All he had to do was just raise some persecution. And it tells us that the believers were all scattered abroad except the apostles who were there at Jerusalem. They're the ones who had heard that command, but God saw fit to keep them at Jerusalem because God was going to spread the gospel, not merely through the apostles, but through the Christians. In other words, not just through the preachers, but through the laymen. The same principle is true today. Tentmaker Ministries. God can move people in times of famine. For example, Jacob and the sons and his sons went down to Egypt because of a famine. God specifically did that, that to get them to Egypt, whereby he could make them into a great nation, whereby he could deliver them, redeem them at a point in time so that they could look back and say, God is the God of Israel. He moved them in times of famine. God can move people in times of blessing. For example, when he moved Abraham to the promised land out of Ur of Chaldees, again, Another situation like we have with Paul here. Paul, uh, Abraham was living in the cultural epicenter of his ancient world. And God said, I want you to take a camping trip and go to a very, very obscure place, a location that didn't have the local Walmart in it, and I want you to move there. And Abraham went out in faith, it says, not knowing whether he went, Hebrews chapter 11. God moved him. Because God had a plan, not merely for Abraham, but a plan that would reach the entire world. Abraham was not a professional missionary. But Abraham was moved by God to a location where God was going to do something very, very special. Are you sensitive to the moving of God in your life as a tent maker? He dwelt with Isaac and Jacob in tents, by the way. It says so in Hebrews. God can move during times of blessing. Abraham moving him to the promised land. God can move when we don't understand. Abraham went out not knowing where he went. Don't resist when you sense the call of God upon your life. But, and here's the caveat, just make sure that it is his call so that you will be a more effective servant like Paul with Aquila and Priscilla. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for your word tonight. We pray that you will move each one of us to be the tent makers that you've called us to be. We don't have to be professionals. But we can be serving Jesus Christ right where we are, at the time in which we live, and with the people with whom we currently have contact. It doesn't have to be something super duper special. 
doesn't have to be an angelic visitation that tells us this is what we're supposed to do. It doesn't have to be a bolt of lightning out of the blue. It doesn't have to be because we already have our theological seminary training. We can be used by you if we are yielded and willing. Father, cause us to understand that. Cause us not only to have the theological head knowledge, but not to use the stupid resistance tactics of, well, if God wants to save the uh, elect heathen, he can do it without you and me. Help us to understand that we have been commissioned to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, and that includes the United States, on the block where we live, in the house of the neighbor next door. Father, we commit these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight, if I can find my page again, is number 605, Living for Jesus.